Hello and welcome back to Lunch Break Heroes. You might be looking at me right now and thinking, dang Steve, you look different. Sharper. I can almost see the pores in your alabaster skin. I can almost reach out and... All right, maybe your thoughts aren't quite that creepy, but hey, I got a new camera and some new lights and a whole bunch of other stuff that goes along with them. I had some extra budget at the end of the year and I had to blow it or, you know, pay taxes on it. And seeing this stuff come in was like a second Christmas. And then a third, and then a fourth, and then a fifth. Because with all the shipping delays, of, of which I think we need to be understandable, everything came in in multiple shipments over the course of like two weeks. But now it's here and everything looks great and I'll shut up now because I could go on and on about my new super cool camera and that's not at all what you're here for. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about some of the homebrew rules that I like best and that I think will be totally great in your game. <sighs> During an intense combat session, there are few things more exhilarating than rolling a natural 20 and scoring a critical hit against the bad guys. Yes, I get to roll twice for damage. And there are a few things more deflating than rolling a one for damage both times. Son of a bitch. To eliminate this disappointment, rule that all critical hits receive whatever damage the players rolled, plus modifiers, plus the full damage of their weapon. So if the paladin scores a critical hit with her greatsword, she's got an extra 12 damage, that's 2d6s, on top of her normal damage. With this rule, every critical hit is guaranteed to deal more damage than a normal attack and really feel like it's doing critical damage to the enemy. Every once in a while, players will run into a brick wall. Sometimes literally, but more often figuratively. Maybe they don't know where to go, or they don't have the right MacGuffin for the job. In these cases, they might spin their wheels trying to figure out how to progress, losing whatever narrative momentum they would built up. Rather than let that happen, allow your players to spend a point of inspiration and go, aha, I know a guy, or I have just the thing for this. In those cases, Either an NPC of the player's design can come to their aid and give them help, or you know the information that they need, or they can pull a mundane item out of their pack that they just happen to have, which will get them moving forward again. Not only does this help keep your game moving forward, but it also gives the players a small hand in world building by letting them create an NPC of their very own. Speaking of homebrew stuff, we're all about adventures and storytelling here at Lunch Break Heroes, and as a dungeon master and a content creator, I know that coming up with stuff, especially on the fly, can be super difficult. So I came up with something to help me and you create adventures whenever you need them. It's the deck of many quests. Inside this attractive box with its super sexy magnetic clasp are 200 cards. 50 quest cards, 75 creature cards, and 75 item cards. Start by drawing a quest card and then reading it Mad Libs style. Fill in the blanks for creatures and items with other cards from the deck to create one of over 200,000 unique adventures. Mix in some of your own imagination for something that is entirely unique for your game. If you're in the United States, you can get this over on Amazon.com. Or if you're anywhere else in the world or simply just don't want to fatten Jeff Bezos' wallet, you can pick it up over on LunchBreakHeroes.com. I'll put a link in the description down below. The rules state that it takes a full action to drink a potion. And from a realism perspective, I suppose that makes sense. I mean, if I have to pull a bottle out, uncork it, and chug its contents, it's gonna take me a handful of seconds. But as realistic as that is, it really sucks from a gameplay perspective. And since we're playing a game, I think that fun and gameplay take precedence over realism. Basic healing potions only heal for 1d4 hit points. If you've got a spellcaster or are a spellcaster, that same action can be used to cast Healing Word for 1d4 plus your spellcasting modifier, or even better, Cure Wounds for 1d8 hit points. So right there, the usefulness of healing potions is limited. 
Aside from having superior healing methods, the rules are asking you to sacrifice your action, which would otherwise be used to attack your enemy, and all of that in order to heal a few measly hit points, which after a certain point are less than the average damage output of your enemies. Now I'm all for difficult choices in games, but this one feels like a hard choice for the sake of a hard choice. In fact, it nullifies the usefulness of healing potions entirely. So in order to keep healing potions useful, let players sloppily chug them during their bonus action like a bunch of toddlers that just discovered Kool-Aid. I don't know about you, but I'm not at the table to count beans. Unless it's an adventure that involves magic beans, giants, golden geese, and whatever, not the point. I'm at the table to tell a story with my players and have fun. And for me, keeping track of something like encumbrance just gets in the way of that. I don't care if you're carrying 50 different items with no backpack or how much gold, silver, and copper weigh. If Link can carry all that crap he carries in the Zelda games, you can do it at my table. Granted, I do expect my players to keep what they carry within reason and not take advantage. Just because there's no encumbrance doesn't mean you could walk around with six sets of plate armor in your inventory or a solid gold door. Ain't happening. So, don't be stupid, and I don't care what you're carrying. Along a similar vein, I don't care for tracking ammunition. How many arrows do you have left? I don't care. Maybe you do, but I don't. If a player wants to track ammunition for the sake of their character or immersion, then so be it. But this is just one of those things I cannot be bothered to care about, much less enforce. This one is unbalanced, and I fully admit that. Persuasion is the only skill where I rule that if you perform it well enough in real life at the table, then you don't have to roll for it. Yeah, it's not like when I ask for strength checks and if the player can bench 300 pounds, I go, yeah, yeah, you scaled that cliff, no problem, way to go, beefcake. But for this, if the player talks to an NPC and makes such a compelling argument that I as a DM are both convinced and impressed, no check needed. Pass, go, collect that $200. The world is your oyster, you silver-tongued devil. And and if you can bench 300 pounds, you, yeah, no, you, you can you can do whatever you want to. This one feels like a gimme, but I'm gonna include it anyway. Who isn't familiar with the rule of cool? And who doesn't include it in one way or another? If your players come up with something that isn't quite in alignment with the rules or it's in a gray area or heck, even if it breaks the rules, if it would create an amazing, awesome, epic, or just plain old funny moment, consider letting it happen. Push the rules aside for one brief moment and embrace the cool and the absurd. Squish the bad guys by dropping a polymorphed elephant on their head. Grab onto an enemy dragon's back and ride it into the sky. Challenge the Goblin King for leadership. Just be cool and have fun. Flanking is an optional rule that I've had in every single one of my games. It adds a tiny bit of tactics to combat that is otherwise a generic slugfest and gives advantage to the flankers. Unfortunately, giving continuous advantage to players who are on either side of an enemy eh, can make combat a little too easy. With advantage, you're basically doubling your chances of being able to hit the enemy. And with two players on either side, that enemy's chances of being hit by either are quadrupled. Is my math right? I, I think so. I don't know. I kind of suck at math. Anyways, it's a huge bonus against a single enemy. If you want to lessen that bonus a bit, but still reward players for using tactics, give the players who are flanking the enemy a plus two to their hit roll instead, or plus four, whatever you want. Now, this can stack with other existing bonuses, making it pretty significant, but still not quite as significant as doubling or quadrupling the chance to hit. I like tension in my game. There's nothing better than ending combat and having everyone heave a collective sigh of relief because they weren't sure they were gonna make it out. And when a character drops to zero hit points and drops to the floor, that's when tensions really rise up. Do the other players go and heal them or do they stay focused on the enemy? But that tension disappears real quick 
when the down player starts rolling successful death saves and announcing to the party, oh, he's got two successes, nothing to worry about, charge. Having that information in front of all of the players really destroys the tension of having a down player and it introduces a lot of opportunities for metagaming, even from those who typically don't do that sort of thing. To alleviate all of that, either have the player roll death saves in secret or let the DM roll them. In the latter case, even the down player doesn't know if their character's gonna die. And come on, that's kind of fun. I mean, at least for me, I don't know about you or the player, but I dig it. Holy crap, rolling a one on your hit die when you level up sucks. Like seriously, all that time spent adventuring and fighting monsters only to get a measly frickin' one? Terrible, just terrible. Give your unlucky players a break. Let them re-roll those ones during a level up, or at least give them the option to take the average if they roll below that. I had one player who rolled a one for four levels in a row. That's astonishingly unlucky. And you know what? On that last time, I had him re-roll it because the guy needed a break. He rolled another one. 